away. Away we go. Very good. Well, Bill, uh, thank you so much for your time today. You're welcome. Bill, before we uh, begin, could you just give us a little background as to uh, who who is Bill Newton, what's Bill Newton done, and uh, and why we're here in Asheville, <laughs> North Carolina? Uh, I'm. Uh, uh, we're we're here to talk about this book that I've written. Uh, that I would love to tell you that I've been dying to write for my whole life, but that wouldn't be true. Uh, I was sort of nagged into buying it or writing it uh, by my uh, good friend, Pat Leahy, who uh, dug it out of some old files and said, hey, you need to put this into a book. And I said, nah, that's a stupid idea. Let's don't do that. And he kept nagging me and nagging me. Uh, and so we're here to talk about that book that basically is Pat's idea. Uh, and I, I wrote the book for a group of men out in Beaverton, Oregon, where I was doing a men's conference. And the original title of that was Finishing Strong. And the idea was to encourage men uh, to get serious about their faith and to uh, pony up. Uh, and become what God wants us as men to be. Uh, I've been blessed by God with all sorts of experiences. Grew up an athlete, uh, went to the Naval Academy, uh, flew uh, uh, A6s in Vietnam, mm. uh, then was blessed to go to Harvard Business School and uh, bought my own companies, worked in big corporation, uh, progressive insurance. And um, after selling all the companies, I've become a pastor and I'm a weird pastor. Um, so I'm sitting here as a weird pastor who doesn't want to retire and wants to go out running. That's where I am. And why are you a weird pastor? I don't have a normal pastor's uh, personality. Uh, uh, yeah, I, that's probably enough said. Uh, well, I, I I I know that you're a, you're a you you're a straight straight talking man, uh, and I I think that a lot of your background has has um, crafted you in that direction. Uh, in, in fact, you, I, you mentioned you were in the you're in, you're a Navy flyer flying A sixes. Uh, you're 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 a football player. Um, t tell us about the importance of of straight talk, uh, speaking the truth with uh, with love. And what what uh, what happened in your life to have uh, um, made you this way? Um, well, what happened in in my life to make me this way? I think I grew up in a family where um, we dealt with conflict directly. And I, I learned, I think, at an early age that if you really love someone and care for them, you'll tell them the truth. Why? Because the truth is really what sets us free. Now, I didn't know the biblical background of it then, but I, I learned that early on. Uh, I think you and I talked earlier. I'm really good at speaking the truth naturally. I'm not very good at the speaking the truth with love and gentleness. God had to give me that. Uh, and over the years, he gave me, uh, he gives me that when I need it. Uh, and to me, it's one of the most important parts of loving an individual is being willing to risk the possibility that they don't like you or that they may get mad at you uh, because what you had to say was actually truthful, but they didn't want to hear it but it's actually good for them. If we think about it in the physical sense, you don't want to go to a doctor with cancer who doesn't want to tell you that you have cancer because it might hurt your feelings. You want a doc who will tell you, you have a cancer and we need to remove it. That's the sense in which lovingly dealing with sin is a loving thing for us to do one to another. and. Over the years, because of playing sports and 
because of being in the Navy and uh, I'm pr very good at doing that with men. I can get in a lot of trouble doing it with women. Uh, but with guys, I know when to whack them around. Mm -hmm. I know when to be soft. I know when to touch them on the shoulder and those things. Uh, and men respond to men in a different way. So I, I've gravitated toward ministry to men uh, and counsel with men. Does that, that answer that your question? A, a, absolutely hands, a, a answers the question. And we're going to get back uh, to that as it relates to Endure, the title written by uh, Bill Newton and published by Shepherd Press and available uh, in May of 2022. Uh, but what do men need? Straight talk, truth spoken in love. What do men need uh, uh, these days that you see that you are giving to them? You said that you know how to whack them, you know how to touch them on the shoulder, uh, and they respond to you. What do men need? Well, I think most of our men today, first of all, need to know that it's okay to be a man. Mm. Uh, we live in a culture today that is very uh, anti-male. Right. And not only do they need to know that it's okay to be a male, but God has blessed you to be a male. Uh, and so that's the very first thing they need to, they need to know. Uh, the second thing that they know they need to know is that the kind of two role models that are given to us by our culture in media and film and TV is uh, the real macho kind of uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger guy or the real uh, feminized guy who uh, acts more like a female than a, than a male. Neither of those two are what we're meant to be, right. which is responsible leaders right. uh, in our family units. Uh, and so they, they need that. And to be responsible means to grow up, uh, to set away the toys of being a child, and to realize that we've been blessed now with a whole set of, of wonderful gifts that God's given us as adult males. Uh, and only from God himself and God's word do we get the right framework of uh, how all that fits together. And also by the spirit of God, do we get the power to be able to, to move in this direction. On our own, myself and everybody else, without the spirit's help, this is an impossible thing to do. And how does how does your book address this? Will it, will we find this message in Endure? Uh, well, I hope you do. Okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, the book itself is not a, a a narrative that goes from one thing to another. It's a set of seventeen different circumstances that I've been through or experienced or or was counseling in uh, that deal with important elements of what it means to be a grown-up male. Uh, and by those instances then, uh, one can uh, use those instances that are in most cases really practical things. They're not uh, pointy-headed, uh, intellectual things. They're down-to-earth circumstances. So in reading those one at a time and then moving back to the study guide where I try and point that men to uh, scriptures that really have authority. My word has no authority. All it can do is point to the place. So if they read the chapter and then take the time to go back to the study guide and work their way right through it, they will see where the Bible speaks to the very concept that's in that. 
And the reality is men change, all of us change, from the inside out is the only way to make mm -hmm. permanent change happen. Mm -hmm. uh, and so what I'm after in the book is to change men's thinking about these core issues. And I point them to the scriptures. God by his spirit and, and his word can do the changing. And I hope that he will. The, you, you said uh, 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 you, uh, there, is, there is a concept that you pointed to about being a grown-up male. Um, that assumes that we have a lot of males who are not grown up. Someone coined the phrase adult essence. Uh, they're, they're not adolescents, they're not adults, they're adult essence. Can you just speak to that? What do you see as a, as a, as a, as a leader? Someone that's been in, in a position of leadership, uh, someone who has been grown up, uh, what do you see? What, what are some of the impediments, the, 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 the problems that, ma that males face that they're not growing up? Um, well, I think first off, the, the number of reasons why men are not grown up is is legion. It's it's you know from here to there's a, a million reasons. Uh, I, in in my experience, part of it is a lot of them are what I call chinos. Uh, that what I mean by that is. Christians in name only. Mm. Uh, they've been led to believe that uh, if you walk down an aisle and said the right answers to four or five questions, and then you came to church, and maybe you gave a little money, that you're a believer. Uh, that's a far cry from what first century Christians were. Uh, a lot of them have then been poorly taught. Uh, there are a lot of places where I remember uh, Alistair used to give a comment, and I'll probably get it messed up, but so-and-so pastor has a thousand uh, reference verses, but the message is always the same. Uh, and the idea is that, that they're an inch deep and a mile wide, meaning they don't really know who God is, who Christ is, what the Bible has to say, because they don't know their Bibles and they haven't been taught uh, well. Um, some haven't just been challenged uh, to grow up or confronted with their what I forget what you called it, adolescent, adult, adult essence, adult yeah. essence, uh, absence. Uh, and with men, oftentimes, uh, I think often, and I can only speak for myself, I have to be hit with a two by four sometimes before you actually get my attention. And guys often need another guy to step up to them and say, hey, Carl, when are you growing up? Mm -hmm. Let's get with it here. You're old enough to get with the program and you aren't there. Let's get going. And we need other men to help us with that. And your book helps with that. And Hopefully. And it starts with thinking, doesn't it? Yes. Can you explain? Um, I've, I've been in the Navy. I've been in corporate America. Uh, and one of the things that often happens in, in a big organization is you will get a training program that is focused totally on behavior. And everybody has to go through it. And then the big wigs in the company think everybody will go out and do what's said. And it very seldom works out. And the reason it doesn't work out is that real change starts with what we believe. What we believe mm. is tested by the trials of life. Mm. It becomes a conviction, then it becomes an attitude and becomes a behavior. Let me give you a simple illustration. Three-year-old boy walks into mom's kitchen. Mom has an electric stove. The electric stove has pretty little red coils on the top of it. Mom says to the child, 
don't touch those. The child in his thinking says, they look really cool. I think I'll touch them anyway. He touches them. The trials of his life tell him that what mom had to say is actually truthful. So his thinking now changes from when mom talks, maybe mom knows what she's talking about because of the trials of life. His conviction is maybe I'll listen to mom. Mm -hmm. His attitude is mom's not as stupid as I thought. And his behavior is now more obedient than it was before. The same things happen to us as adults. Uh, but in the, in the realm of growing up as a Christian man, what our thinking is based on is theology. Mm -hmm. And we all have a theology. It's either as big as a pinhead or it's growing every day. The more it grows, the more our thinking is impacted. And Paul actually speaks to that in Romans where he says in, um, in, in 12 it is uh, that the way to grow up is to renew your mind. Uh, and when your mind becomes renewed, then the change that happens starts from within and it's permanent. Uh, the ch corporate and Navy things would have been much better if they attempted to change people's thinking mm. rather than simply focus on their behaviors. Mm. So when I teach men or when I'm writing this book, I want to change mm -hmm. and help them change their thinking. Mm -hmm. That then can lead to permanent change, not just an outward uh, you know, whitewash as mm -hmm. Christ called things. Mm -hmm. I don't want just behavior. I, I want to encourage men to change from the inside out. It's not about behavior modification, but uh, internal change, which is... Behavior change. modification is the result, mm -hmm. not the objective. You'll be happy to know that the Marines have, uh, one of, uh, as their newest slogans, that the battle is won within. So maybe, maybe there is a, 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 renewed, a, a new perception of, of where they need to start. Uh, and, but, uh, but Christians and, 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 and teachers and pastors and leaders like you have, have known this lesson for a long time. You've put it in your book, uh, uh, various practical lessons uh, uh, that you want to apply to men and change their thinking so they can uh, so they can test it uh they can grow a a, a conviction that this 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 direction is true change their attitude and then their behavior can you take a chapter or a lesson from endure and can you can you just walk us through that continuum uh, uh one of the lessons and what you want men to uh, uh to apprehend who oh, um well, the one that comes to mind because you kind of mentioned it, I, I believe, I can't remember exactly the title, but it's, it is develop uh, godly habit patterns. Uh, and I've probably gotten the title wrong because I haven't looked at the book lately. Uh, but I, I go back to uh, my days as an aviator. You were taught in aviation to have really good habit patterns. Why? Because when you came to the, the A6 on the flight deck, your, your first uh, requirement was to inspect the airplane to make sure everything was safe, to make sure the bombs were properly fused, to make sure that they're properly loaded. And the object is you want to live long. So you want your habit patterns so that you don't forget anything. Uh, the saying amongst aviators is there's old pilots and there's bold pilots, but there's no old bold pilots. Mm -hmm. And the idea is be smart, do things right, and you will rely on your training and you will then uh, live. I mean, and I, I went to Vietnam, I had two kids and a wife, I wanted to make it back to them. So when I got up on the deck uh, and you're in your, your flight gear, you're in your vest, you've got your gloves on, you've got your helmet on, and it's 105 degrees out, your instincts are to take all that off and risk things 
if there's a fire or whatever, you're in big trouble. So you don't do that. Uh, the same thing is true for us then as believers, as men. Develop really good habit patterns so that uh, you can then fall back on them. Uh, the idea is, let's just say, speak the truth. Uh, if you know that your habit is to always speak the truth and never be tempted to tell even a small white lie, life becomes very pleasant and, uh, or I shouldn't say probably pleasant, it can be unpleasant, but it becomes very, uh, 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 I don't know, controllable or, or peaceful or you're at, you don't have to worry about what did I say to Carl and what did I say to Jim and did I say the same thing to my wife? No, I don't fiddle around at the edges. I can remember telling my people at my company about ethical things. We don't even want to walk close to the edge of the cliff. We stay away from it so that we don't have to worry about a minor slip and we fall over the edge. So your habit patterns uh, are things that help you grow up. Uh, I won't risk going into a, uh, uh, you know, a place where what the Bible says, uh, you know, I don't want my eyes to see something right. like that. So I'm not going there. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, 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 I go through it. And I think the idea then of developing habit patterns and relying on them. I just recently heard a friend say when he had gone through a very difficult time, his wife was deathly ill and, and the doctors were saying she might not make it. And at the same time, he was trying to sell his company because it was time for him to retire. Uh, and he said, you know, I'm trying to keep something on the one hand that I, I want I want to have forever and I'm about to lose it. And on the other hand, I'm trying to get rid of something so that I can enjoy life better. And the stress of things falling apart was killing me. And he said, I had a Marine friend who told me in cir circumstances like that, you don't rely on character, you fall back on your training. Mm. And you're, if your training is have De develop good habit patterns, you're on solid ground. Does that answer the question? It, it answers the question, and it's striking, I think, for me, uh, your example of, 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 of being in Vietnam and being faced with life and death, wanting to come back home to your children, and that forced you, you to rely on habit patterns that were inculcated by training because you, the, your thinking was framed by, by life and death and values that, that, that you, 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 you held dear, your family, your children. It seems like men need to have that framed for them so that they can, to use your phrase, pony up, so that they can see that there's, there, there, there are eternal things at stake. Would you agree with this? Could you speak to I, that? I love the way you just said it, frankly. Uh, in, in Nam, when we were, I mean, I've got 250 combat missions. We were there for 11 months. Uh, every day we went out, you were subject to it. Life and death was on, on the line. The reality is in our walk, eternal life is on on the line are you are you a believer and if so then the eternal life your eternal life is set but the eternal life of other people are impacted by by what you're doing because our example as men as leaders is what people watch so in a sense really eternal life is on the line and my eternal soul is is a valuable thing what is it christ says uh, what does it benefit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? Uh, we don't believe that we can lose our salvation if we're believers, so I'm not trying to say that. But our soul is precious. Uh, our, and, and the reality is, if I believe what the Bible says, I've got Christ by his Spirit inside me, 
So why would I want to take him to a place of sinfulness or a thing of sinfulness or what? I wouldn't. I live my life, if I understand what the Bible says, I live my life with Christ with me. That would be, that's an incredible habit pattern in right. itself, is right. it not? Right. Uh, to think everywhere I go, every time I open my mouth, uh, every time I make a decision, Christ is right here with me. How would I do it if Christ was physically right, right here with me? Right. He is right. with me, yeah. just in a different sense. Right. Using, is that yes, fit? Well, that, that definitely helps using that. And we framed it in eternal in eternal values. And that quorum Deo, God, is, we're, we, live, we live our life quorum Deo. Jesus is with us. So speak to the man who is, has been saved, but finds that his life is aimless. He doesn't have an anchor. Uh, he's meandering. Uh, maybe, maybe even lacking, lacking that purpose because they, his life has not been framed. Speak to him. Could you speak to him and 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 and, and give him give him a give him a, a, a words of wisdom from 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 a coach to someone that needs to get in the game? Uh, wow, that's a hard one, uh, and it's probably particularly hard for me because I I haven't dealt with that personally. Sometimes it's it's more helpful to deal if you've been through it yourself. But I would fall back on where where I began thinking the thinking of, of that person is is messed up it begins with uh i'm you're you're made in the image of god you are precious in god's sight if you are a believer that means that god has now called you to himself he's made you a member of his family and you are now a part of the royal family you have uh, incredible value and worth in God's sight. And my guess is that individual doesn't believe that. Uh, so you need to change your thinking. Uh, you have, if you are a believer, you have now been made a new creation. And so there's a whole new world of things for you to do. I can't remember whether I put it in the book. It's borrowed from... Uh, another individual, but if you think about it as a new creation for this man, it's like uh, 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 a caterpillar. A caterpillar is uh, confined to the ground or to a limb, and he can only crawl around. But in the course of the caterpillar's life, he then goes into a cocoon, and in the process, he goes through a metamorphosis, which is like what happens to us. He gets a new life. Mm -hmm. And when he comes out of the, the cocoon, he's now a butterfly with the abilities that have been given to him by God to fly. What kind of caterpillar after being transformed would simply stay on the ground and walk on limbs and mm -hmm. simply move along the ground? He wouldn't. You've been transformed. You've now got incredible power. The Spirit of God lives within you. Uh, rely on that and get, get on mm -hmm. with it. Mm -hmm. But it starts with what do you believe? What's your theology? Uh, and, you know, an individual guy has probably all sorts of reasons why he can't latch on to that. And the only way to get at that would be to listen rather than coach. Uh, if he were in front of me, I'd want to listen for a long time uh, before uh, coaching. Uh, I can give you an illustration. Please do. I, I sat with a, a young man who was a West Point grad uh, who uh, was sort of in the same condition. Uh, and... Uh, he was not going anywhere in life. So I asked him to tell me his life story. When he told me his life story, he had lost his father uh, at the age of six. 
His mother had to go to work. He was the oldest of three kids and he had to go. And he went on to tell me about how he did in high school. And he was actually a pretty good student and pretty good athlete. And then he'd gone on in life. And uh, But no place in the world for, for God or moving forward. And I remember at the end of him telling me his whole life story, I looked at him and I said, I can understand why you don't believe in God. Mm. I said, you you grew up your whole life. You never had a dad to play catch with you in the backyard. Mm -hmm. You never had a dad to come to your ball games. You never had a dad to uh, to come to your high school graduation and, and stir you on. And as I was talking, tears formed in his mm. eyes. And he looked at me and he said, you're going to have to shut up. He said, I, I can't listen to any of this anymore. He had come, and I, I said at the end of it, I said, I can understand why you don't want to come to a God who in your mind has treated you in this way. And then I went on to talk about the gospel. He was bawling his eyes out. Uh, he didn't come to faith then, but he came to faith about five or six days later. And the whole key to it was I listened to what he had to say uh, and listened carefully to what it was that it hurt him. It was a legitimate, incredible hurt that he went through. But you had to then move, move on from that. So guys who were in those circumstances probably have all sorts of stories, and you can't get at it by just throwing them some words, you have to listen to them. Does you, that make sense? It makes sense. Do you think that that is the bottom of many a uh, man's inability to grow up because they, because dad was absent or they maybe they had bad uh, uh, male role models? There's something that's missing. Or some traumatic event, uh, thing that's happened. Even, uh, if you've paid attention to Ted Turner, who's mm -hmm. now passed away, uh, Ted uh, uh, would say often that when he was growing up, he had a sister or brother, I can't remember exactly what, that had been uh, taken away very early. I can't remember whether it was sickness or whatever. Very, very horrible death. Mm. And his comment about and if you followed Ted Turner, you'd, you'd know what uh, his comment was, why would I worship a God mm -hmm. who did that to my sister? And if, if you look at Ted as successful as he was, and he was incredibly successful, uh, he was asked by Barbara Walters once, uh, what is success? And mm -hmm. his answer was, success is an empty bag, but you don't know it till you get there. It's pretty good for a non-believer. But if you know his life, he owned, I forget, 16 properties, and he went from one to the other to the other, fishing and hunting and basically doing boy things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he was entertaining himself the whole time. Even business was an entertainment and a challenge to, uh, to him. Uh, so, yeah, I think it's at the root of a lot of things. Do you think, I mean, speak to, to your experience in working with men and men who have had an experience like Ted Turner and, and have, have had success only to find that it's an empty bag and, and, and have had difficult cir circumstances that have wounded them and they haven't grown up. Is it possible to grow, to grow up? Uh, is it possible to change direction despite despite what's gone on and and paint a picture of uh, of the the benefits and the the beauty of, of being fully grown men? Uh, first of all, we we know it's possible because there are people like that that are all around. I mean, I am one. Um, I had. Uh, I had parents that in one sense were great, but I had an overbearing mom. Uh, 
and my dad then sort of uh, wussed out, as we guys would say. Uh, but both of them loved me and all that stuff, but there are a lot of scars from that. So I know that personally, but I also see it in, in men that I've been through. Uh, and the Bible tells us, look at Paul. We don't know what his background was, but he was certainly turned around. He's like uh, Osama bin Laden of his day, and yet God turned him completely. If he can turn him, or you think of Peter, big old Peter whose mouth goes like crazy, and then he turns into a guy who writes first and second Peter. What an incredible turnaround. Uh, but why, I think you prepped me, <laughs> What's, what are the benefits of growing mm -hmm. up? I think the first benefit is just a settled peace mm -hmm. that with God, mm -hmm. that no matter what happens in life, uh, no matter what trials I'm going through, no matter what the circumstance, uh, the main things are taken care of. And that kind of piece is, what is it, the MasterCard thing is priceless. Mm -hmm. You can't put a price mm -hmm. on it. There's a freedom from the chains of sinful behavior. Uh, one of the biblical pictures always is that sin has us captured. And when you're in it, you don't think that. Mm -hmm. But only when you're freed from it can you see that I'm no longer a captive to the, to the evil one. That's a wonderful feeling. Uh, from my own experience as well, and I think it describes it this way, uh, when you come to Christ and you really get it, it's like going from black and white TV, mm -hmm. the old one, you know, that was mm -hmm. sure. this way, mm -hmm. to uh, a three-dimensional holographic color life. It's that much different, and it's, it's that good. Life takes on a, a newer and a deeper meaning than it ever had before. Uh, when we're in our patterns of sin, sin feels good for a moment, but there's always the piper to pay. Uh, you're, you're rid of that. You don't have to struggle with that. And I don't mean that we never sin, but when we're at that point, we've given up uh, our uh, right or whatever to willfully sin. Uh, and I put in the book some, I, one of the chapters is, I think there's a point in time for everybody where we need to say, God, I want to do this. I willfully want to do this. Uh, and that means then at some point, I quit doing those things that I know I ought not do. And now the sins I discover are those deeper ones that, uh, you know, I need to find out about myself because I'm, I'm actually worse than I think, not better than I think. Uh, but worship, uh, I see I now have a helper here, uh, becomes a blessing, not a required task. Uh, prayer becomes a blessing, not a required task. Uh, and you begin to understand and trust me, this is very was very difficult for me. You go to the Naval Academy, you go to Harvard, uh, and the idea is you can do anything. All you have to do is set your mind to it. The four Ps or five Ps, whatever it is, you know, plan, perfect uh, preparation and uh, all of that. You find out independence is an illusion. Uh, and you're okay with the reality that I'm dependent on God for everything. Whatever I have, he gave it to me. The next breath that I take, he gave it to me. So I'm, I'm okay with being dependent. And I get this idea that now there are really things I can do now that I never could do before, not because of me, but because of the Christ who lives within me. So I've now got a confidence that's incredible, but it's not in me. It's in what God can do for me. Uh, that's probably a little bit of, of what comes when you just, and I think Piper says it 
best when he says uh, that uh, God is most glorified when I'm most satisfied with him and him alone. And this is not a weak life. This is learning to depend on God and to, to, to give in to to give in to what you're recommending, which is in Scripture. It's, it's a strong life. Yeah, I, that's probably why I say I don't have a normal pastor's personality. I'm not a, I'm aggressive, I'm, and that's got a good side and a bad side. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and I'm a doer. I mean, I, uh, if, if you've ever heard the idea of a firing pattern, we all have a firing pattern. The three things are uh, think, act, feel. We all do those three things, but we do them in different orders. I'm a think. I think through things very, very carefully. But then as soon as I've thought them through, I act like now. And about three miles down the road, I'll consider feelings. That's my, the way God put me together. Because of that, I've had to learn to move the feelings up because they're really important. And for 40 years of my life, I didn't think feelings were important at all. Uh, but I, I don't know exactly where we are. Uh, but anyway, God does those things for us. And that's part of growing up is realizing mm. there's, there's none of this that guys often say, well, that's the way God made me. So just, and I'm the first one to say, malarkey uh let's get on your knees and say what do you need to learn uh, i don't care if you like to shop if your wife likes to shop learn how to shop mm. uh, i don't care if you're selfish let's get on our prayer uh, knees and say god i don't know what i need but i need to get over this uh, by his spirit if you believe mm -hmm. that christ lives within you what problem is not solvable? Mm -hmm. So we have to have the courage to change, uh, as one politician once said. Uh, but we really need to have the faith to change, but the disposition that we need to change in order to grow up. Well, and we also need, I used to, in one of the trainings, give, give this uh, little device. It was made out of plastic. It was a round thing, and it had on it IT. Oh. it and I would give it to people and you know what that is it's around to it <laughs> what you need is to get around, around to, to it, it. <laughs> all of the things you just mentioned are important yeah. and good mm -hmm. but eventually you've got to go do it. To it do it mm -hmm. get around to mm -hmm. it do it uh, and it's if you're a procrastinator at all there's always a reason not to to do things. Always a justification. Yeah. Okay. Thank you.